So in the middle of this shaded Arcadian grove, uh, surrounded by all these trees and animals with great symbolic meaning, uh, Orpheus starts to sing. And he announces a new project, a new, uh, a new song. It was pretty significant. O oh, muse, my mother, let Jove inspire my poem, for all things yield to Jove's power. On prior occasions I have sung the dominion of Jove, lifting my lyre to deal with so weighty a subject, the fall of the giants, the bolts hurled victorious down on the fields of Flag Flag Flagrea. But now the task of my lyre requires a lighter touch, as I sing of young boys whom the gods have desired, and of girls seized by forbidden and blameworthy passions. So he is announcing a, uh, a song that is less epic, but still, uh, uh, well, less epic than perhaps the convention, but he's taking a more epic view because we're still sta we're still in uh, the Ovidian project here. We're just extending the idea. It's a bit of a turn from the epic realm of the divine, but he's focusing now more specifically on humanity and specifically human sexuality. Uh, human sexuality as a continuum, human sexuality as subject to evolution and change. Uh, he's curious that he does start within that from our perspective, very highly definitive uh, binary of boys and girls. Impossible also not to note that there is a note of uh, misogyny there, of boys who are being preyed upon by gods, uh, boys are the victims, and girls who are uh, somehow predatory themselves, seized by forbidden and blameworthy passions. Now, is Ovid uh, ironizing that right there and saying, well, you know, they, though, those are blameworthy. Is this a critique of misogyny or is this misogyny itself? kind of a jury out situation there. And he tells the story with this uh, of, well, he tells a number of stories of some um, decadence uh, where the, uh, where sexual passion leads people uh, into realms of unnatural, uh, un unnatural uh, lust and where human beings are vulnerable to uh, the, the sexual depredations of the gods, the more powerful, but also their own, uh, where sexuality comes out of humanity and sexual drive is sometimes a, uh, a distinctly overwhelming force, as we have seen repeatedly throughout of it. He begins with a short uh, portrait of Ganymede, very famous figure. Um, uh, Jupiter found an identity pleasing him more than even his own did. No bird but the eagle bearer of Jove's thunderbolt could deserve this distinction. Without delay, as his counterfeit wings beat the air, he captured the boy who, in spite of Juno's objections, mixes his nectar and serves him now, above now, in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> Um, little servant boy, uh, you know, little house boy. Oh, okay. Um, and then he, uh, he's looking around or Orpheus is looking around at the, uh, at the flora and fauna and the, uh, some of the other, uh, creatures around him. And he picks out, uh, Phoebus loves you, Hyacinthus. And he tells the story of how Phoebus, Apollo, Orpheus's father uh, developed a lust for a uh, for a young boy named Hyacinthus, and so uh, the, the unnatural, uh, let's say, depredations, the homosexual uh, um, uh, homosexual inclinations, are seen as a bit of a family line continuum here. They go back generations. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, the, the story of Hyacinth is Apollo was essentially playing with, uh, with the boy. The boy wasn't particularly interested in him sexually, but, uh, they, uh, they were throwing a discus and one of them, uh, Hyacinthus took a, uh, uh, ran after it, uh, one that Apollo threw. Apollo, of course, very strong, godlike, throws it quite far. 
Hyacinthus runs to get it and it takes a funny hop and bashes him in the face and uh, he dies. And um, all of his blood spills out, all of his blood from his beautiful face, no, not noticeably. The, uh, the face bleeds blood all over the uh, uh, all over the grass and uh, Apollo is quite heartbroken to lose his young friend and he says your death is the cause of my self-reproach and my sorrow for my right hand must be charged with the crime of your murder and I alone am responsible for your destruction but where did I err unless our pleasures were errors where was I wrong, unless it was wrong to have loved you? If only I were permitted to die in exchange for my life for your own, but even though fate's law prevents this, you will be with me always. My lips will never forget you. You will be present both in my songs and my music, and a flower will come into being inscribed with my mourning. Later, the le a legend involving the boldest of heroes will be conjured to this flower and read in its markings. And that's a reference to uh, Ajax. But the, uh, essentially this is the, uh, the, the change of the young boy. As he bleeds out onto the grass, then the grass props up or uh, in that field, in that space, grows the hyacinth, the purple flower. Uh, it is a sign of, uh, of rebirth. Uh, it is, a, it is uh, associated with springtime, and here you see it as a remembrance, another uh, remembrance like, uh, uh, like the cypress tree of a kind of lost love. And so spring as a rebirth is also a sign of some uh, defeated love or some remembrance of past failures of desire. Uh, the, um, the, uh, you can, you can get a little giggle and sometimes I do about the, you know, my right hand must be charged with the crime of your murder, right hand. Uh, but also the sense that this is his right hand, not his left, not the evil hand, not the, it's the, the dwat, not the sinestra. This is a, um, this is a claim that, well, you know, our, our love as it were, is perfectly legitimate. And why did this have to happen? Why am I being, what, where is the justice in this? Where is the fairness in this? And so it is seen as completely above board. The truth of Apollo's words appeared as he spoke them, for look where the boy spilled blood now staining the grasses, stops being blood, and at once a new flower springs up shining even more brightly than Tyrian purple and takes on the form, if not the color, of lilies. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely little image and a lovely little image of rebirth, of metamorphosis, of transformation, of all of those things, of evolution, but also of Apollo. He cannot, in this story, he is uh, preying on the young boy and he cannot possess him but he can have this idol that he can focus on and still love. And that carries meaning for him as, a, as an object of art um, throughout the rest of his life, uh, which for Apollo, of course, is eternity. But then uh, Orpheus turns and takes the other tack and says, well, okay, I've, I've told about the young boy uh, <clears throat> being preyed upon by the, uh, by the god. The other part of it is, of course, well, women who are, uh, or girls who are uh, led astray, or, or not led astray, but girls who are uh, uh, blame, who have blameworthy passions. And he takes up this, uh, the story of uh, uh, the uh, Propoetides, and the Serestai. Uh, the Propoetides are women, uh, the daughters of a uh, city in, in Cyprus. And uh, the story is a little bit convoluted in different forms again. 
but uh, in Ovid, you uh, the bulk of it is that they are uh, they are prostitutes and uh, they have sinned against Venus, and so Venus uh, sees this as a um, uh, as an insult upon her, and she punishes them by turning them into bulls, significantly masculine, you know, big bulky masculine bull. So there is a gender switch along with a, uh, a, a, a species switch, if you will. So there's something there. And then what's really significant is that we're told in Ovid that, well, okay, there, there were bulls and, but they were, uh, but they're whores. And so they just kept on being whores and whoring around. And, uh, because they just, you know, they, they didn't feel any shame. And then something interesting happens. They change again. They change to stone, from bulls to stone. They become stone statues of bulls. But that is not an act of the goddess. They, we're not told that Venus does this. Uh, it's just a spontaneous change as a result of they're not particularly caring. They're not feeling anything about what they're doing. They are cheapening the act of sexual love. They are cheapening the uh, the currency of desire, which Venus holds very, uh, very sacred. And so they turn to stone. They just don't feel anything anymore. You can see that a number of different ways, uh, but it is something that is coming from them, not the goddess.